Hi, I'm attorney Ramsey Barawi, and this is Your Money, Your Life. Today's segment is about the hope that is provided by a largely unknown improved pension benefit called the VA Aid and Attendance Benefit. Briefly, the Aid and Attendance Benefit is considered to be the third tier of the VA's improved pension. The other two tiers are known as basic and housebound. Each tier has its own level of benefits and qualifications. Today's discussion will be limited to the aid and attendance benefit, a benefit that no doubt needs to be coordinated with other public benefits as older Americans face unprecedented challenges when planning for their long-term care needs, whether that be assisted living or nursing home care. Given the wonders of modern medicine, people are living longer. As a consequence, they're more likely to require some kind of expensive long-term care. Moreover, eligibility restrictions to Medicaid benefits tend to amplify these challenges. If you are a veteran of the military services or the surviving spouse of a veteran, you may very well qualify for aid and attendance benefits. Before we get into the nitty gritty of aid and attendance, it's important to understand that qualifying for this pension benefit is not dependent upon service-related injuries. Rather, the aid and attendance benefit is for veterans and surviving spouses who require the regular attendance of another person to assist with personal functions such as eating, bathing, dressing, undressing, medication dosing, toileting, and adjusting prosthetic devices. Also, it includes individuals who are blind or a patient in a nursing home because of mental or physical incapacity. Plus, assisted care in assisted living facility also qualifies for this benefit. Put another way, under current federal regulations, the aid and attendance veterans benefit can serve as a lifeline to assist older adults requiring assistance with activities of daily living. In this regard, veterans benefits can play a crucial role in planning for long-term care. As such, I believe that veterans benefits represent an important piece in the estate planning puzzle. Unfortunately, many veterans or their surviving spouses, and sometimes even their attorneys, are unaware of the qualification requirements for aid and attendance benefits. So allow me to take this opportunity to discuss the five basic eligibility requirements for the aid and attendance benefit. They are, first, 90 days of active duty service, of which one day was during wartime. Second, limited assets and income. Third, the need for regular assistance from another person. Fourth, the veteran was not dishonorably discharged. And fifth, the claimant is permanently and totally disabled or over the age of 65. So now that you know what these five requirements are, let's discuss each of these requirements in more detail. First, it is obvious that the status as a veteran is a prerequisite to receiving VA aid and attendance benefits. In order to qualify as a veteran, a person must have completed at least 90 days of active military, naval, or air service. Also, at least one day of service must have been during a qualifying wartime period. These types of service that qualify are combat duty, active military service, or service as a cadet in a U.S. military academy. Please note, however, that generally speaking, active duty for training does not qualify as active service. Also, the claimant must have been discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. It is important to understand that the U.S. military assigns one of five discharge categories. They are first, honorable discharge, second, discharge under other than honorable conditions, third, general discharge, fourth, bad conduct discharge, and fifth, dishonorable discharge. It is also important to note that the Secretary of Veterans Affairs retains the discretion to define the term discharge under dishonorable conditions. Therefore, this term can be broad in scope. For example, a discharge other than honorable conditions may be considered a discharge under dishonorable conditions for VA purposes. On the other hand, a discharge under honorable conditions is binding on the Veterans Administration. 
for a listing of specific conditions of discharge that would render a veteran ineligible for benefits, please consult Title 38 of the Code of Federal Regulations. As regards the qualifying wartime period requirement, the periods of war that apply to today's veterans include the Mexican Border War, World War I, World War II, the Korean Conflict, the Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, and recent combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. As regards the limited assets and income requirement, the VA will not award a pension if the claimant's assets are reasonably sufficient to provide for his or her maintenance. The general rule is that a claimant cannot receive an aid and attendance pension benefit if his or her countable assets exceed certain thresholds or if his or her countable income is equal to or greater than the maximum annual pension rate. As regards countable income, it can, however, be reduced by subtracting unreimbursed medical expenses. As regards assets, the threshold for a married couple is 80000 whereas for a single person it is $40,000. However, to the untrained, this is where things can get fuzzy. I say this because the standard that the VA adjudicator uses in determining qualification for aid and attendance benefits isn't necessarily the 80-40 threshold rule, but a somewhat more imprecise standard which asks if the veteran's assets will be used up during the veteran's lifetime. In other words, when considering a claimant's assets, the VA will evaluate net worth by determining whether the claimant's assets without the VA pension are adequate to meet his or her basic needs for a reasonable period of time. In making a determination of eligibility based on assets, the VA considers six items. They are first, life expectancy, second, countable income, third, number of dependents, fourth, potential rate at which funds are depleted, fifth, liquidity of the assets, and sixth, unusual medical expenses. The key is whether a claimant can reasonably utilize his or her assets to meet his or her needs without VA assistance. At this juncture, it's important for me to disclose that the VA excludes certain assets from the net worth calculation. For example, the claimant's primary residence and personal effects suitable to claimant's reasonable mode of life are excluded. Also, the VA considers whether an asset can be easily converted into cash. A simple illustration involves a vacant lot assessed at, let's say, $75,000. However, because of a poor real estate market, there's little, if any, demand for vacant lots. Therefore, if the claimant can show that he or she is unlikely to receive more than $35,000 if the property is sold on the open market, then the property is worth only $35,000 for the net worth calculation purposes. Now let's talk about jointly owned assets. As regards jointly owned assets, they are counted as part of the claimant's estate to the extent of the claimant's ownership share. This rule does not apply to assets owned jointly by a veteran and his or her spouse. Spousal assets are fully included in the net worth calculation. The joint asset rule becomes significant when a claimant owns property jointly with a non-dependent. In addition to asset guidelines, a veteran must also meet income guidelines in order to be entitled to VA pension benefits. A claimant's countable income for VA purposes determines his or her eligibility. The VA determines income for VA purposes by subtracting unreimbursed medical expenses from the claimant's gross income. The VA's definition of gross income is identical to the familiar definition used by the Internal Revenue Service. That definition is all income from whatever source derived unless specifically excluded. The specific exclusions for pension eligibility purposes include unreimbursed medical expenses, welfare, maintenance furnished by a relative, friend, or charitable organization, VA pension benefits, reimbursement for casualty losses, veterans or spousal final expenses, and just debts, educational expenses, child's income, cash surrender value of life insurance, Medicare Part D assistance, or savings, 
and life insurance proceeds on the policy of a veteran. When providing your income on a VA benefits application, please remember to list your gross income before any taxes or other deductions. As regards Social Security benefits, list the total benefit amount you receive. In other words, don't subtract the Medicare deduction. Why? Because VA treats Medicare premiums as unreimbursed medical expenses and thereby already reduces your countable income. As regards interest income, always list the interest income you expect to receive over the next 12 months. As regards distributions from tax-deferred retirement accounts, such as an IRA, these distributions must be listed as income. The VA requires inclusion of the entire distribution as income, even when it reflects a partial return of principal. An exception to including IRA interest as income occurs if the claimant would incur a substantial penalty for withdrawing funds. Now let's talk about trusts in the context of the VA aid and attendance benefit. A question I'm often asked is whether amounts in trust count as assets for income for VA purposes. Generally speaking, the answer depends on the claimant's control over the funds in trust and whether the claimant derives benefits from the trust fund. There is a three-step test to assist in answering whether property, including trust property, should be listed in a claim for benefits. The three steps are, first, actual ownership, second, such control over the property that the claimant may direct it to be used for claimant's own benefit, or third, actual allocation of the funds for the claimant's benefit. Generally speaking, the answers to these three questions will determine if assets owned in trust must be listed on an application for aid and attendance benefits. The most common situation I see regarding a trust established by a veteran involves the veteran giving up control to the trustee, but the trustee issuing payments to the veteran on an as-needed basis. In this situation, the property held in an irrevocable trust is not countable until it is actually allocated for the claimant's use, the claimant in this case being the veteran. However, if the claimant possesses such control that the claimant may direct it to be used for the claimant's benefit, then the assets held in trust are countable, and that's because of the control. In other words, in a trust, any portion of the property made available for the veteran's use is countable income for VA purposes. However, irrevocable trusts established for the benefit of someone not residing with the claimant are treated differently. For example, where a pension claimant inherits shares of stock and during his or her lifetime places them into an irrevocable trust for the benefit of his or her grandchildren, the stock represents income to the claimant in the year received but the trust assets and income are not countable because the claimant retain no right or interest in the property or its future income. Unlike Medicaid, VA does not have a look-back period for the disposition of assets in trust. So long as the veteran does not have a right or interest in the trust, as regards special needs trusts used to protect the assets of an older adult, the VA will consider the funds held in a special needs trust when determining a claimant's net worth. An interesting issue is presented where a veteran has a service-connected disability and qualifies both medically and financially for aid and attendance benefits. When a veteran's permanent and total disability is service-connected, he or she could theoretically qualify for both disability compensation and non-service connected pension benefits. However, the Code of Federal Regulation prohibits such duplication of benefits. In this type of situation, it requires that the veteran formally elect either compensation or pension payments. Once a claimant has established the requisite military service, limited assets, and if under age 65 his or her total disability, the claimant must demonstrate the need for regular aid and attendance of another person. The need for assistance of another person must be regular, but need not be constant. The Code of Federal Regulation defines the need for aid and attendance as helplessness or being so nearly helpless as to require the regular aid and attendance of another person. This requirement is met by establishing that the claimant meets one of the following three criteria. 
First, the claimant is a patient in a nursing home, or second, is blind or nearly blind, or third, significantly disabled as to need or require the regular aid and attendance of another person. The Veterans Benefits Administration uses several factors in determining the need for regular aid and attendance. A claimant need not prove each of them as the VA assesses the claimant's condition as a whole. The factors include whether the claimant can dress or undress by himself or herself, keep himself or herself neat and presentable, whether the claimant can adjust a prosthetic device without assistance, whether the claimant can feed himself or herself, whether the claimant can attend to the wants of nature, and whether the claimant can protect himself or herself from the dangers of his or her daily environment. A claimant must show an actual need for assistance from another person, meaning he or she must provide evidence showing that he or she is actually and currently receiving such assistance. Mere information that he or she requires daily assistance is insufficient to prove a need for regular aid and attendance. Generally, a claimant should submit a physician's affidavit indicating need as well as evidence of actual assistance. An example of evidence is an invoice from a home health agency showing that the services were actually provided. Although the claimant must prove the need for aid and attendance, there is no requirement to prove the need is permanent. Rather, an official interpretation of the regulatory and statutory requirements indicates an increased pension based on the need for aid and attendance. Now let's talk about the aid and attendance benefit for a surviving spouse of a veteran. Beyond the requirements already mentioned, a surviving spouse must meet additional requirements in order to qualify. They are, first, the marriage must be valid and the surviving spouse must have been married to the veteran for at least one year or less than one year if the couple had a child together. Second, the surviving spouse must have been married to the veteran at the time of his or her death. Third, the surviving spouse must have remained unmarried after the veteran's death. Finally, the veteran and surviving spouse must have lived together continuously from the time of marriage until the veteran's death. Usually a marriage is valid for VA purposes when the couple was legally married under the laws of the state where they resided at the time of the marriage. The surviving spouse must establish the validity of the marriage in order to be entitled to pension benefits. This is accomplished by including a statement of marriage on the benefits application which includes details about all of the veteran and surviving spouse's marriages. The statement of marriage indicates the date and place of each marriage, the type of marriage, reason the marriage ended, and the date and place the marriage ended. The claimant should also include a copy of the marriage license or certificate showing his or her marriage to the veteran. Now that we've discussed the qualification requirements for the aid and attendance benefit, it's important to understand what effect, if any, VA aid and attendance benefits have on other public benefits, such as Medicaid. This issue is important when a veteran is over the age of 65 and relying on a comprehensive long-term care plan involving Medicaid planning. Put another way, can establishing a plan to qualify for Medicaid in the event of future long-term care also allow the individual to qualify for the VA aid and attendance benefit? As the rules for qualification under Medicaid and VA aid and attendance are different, Due care must be used when transferring assets to qualify for either program. Also recall that one tool for long-term care planning, a special needs trust, does not reduce the countable net worth for VA purposes. Really, the only similarity is the rule regarding irrevocable trust to which the applicant has no right or access. I also should point out that the VA reduces pension benefits for Medicaid recipients residing in long-term care facilities. One exception to this reduction occurs when the veteran's spouse receives long-term care through Medicaid while the veteran remains in the community. As regards eligibility for SSI, the portion of VA aid and attendance pension benefits resulting from unusual medical expenses is not considered countable income. The portion of the pension that does not relate to medical expenses 
would be considered income based on need for SSI purposes and may reduce an SSI payment. For VA pension eligibility, the VA excludes from countable income, SSI, and other government benefits based on financial need. As regards powers of attorney, it is important to note that the VA does not recognize general powers of attorney executed under state laws. The claimant may appoint a VA accredited attorney. Similarly, the VA will not necessarily allow a state court appointed guardian to file a claim on behalf of an adjudicated disabled claimant, nor will it automatically allow the guardian to be the claimant's representative payee for pension benefits. In the case of an incompetent claimant, the VA has broad power to select and appoint a fiduciary to receive pension payments on the claimant's behalf. The claimant should, even if adjudicated incompetent, sign each application document to the best of his or her ability. This is because, interestingly, the VA allows incompetent claimants to prosecute claims for benefits even if a fiduciary is ultimately appointed to receive the payments. Now let's take a brief look at the historical background of the aid and attendance benefit. Generally, pension payments for veterans of the U.S. military have existed in one form or another since the 18th century. The availability of increased pension payments based on the need for aid and attendance has existed in some form since the 1860s. When aid and attendance was first enacted, it required that the active duty wartime veteran become disabled as a result of his military service. Like other U.S. government programs, over time, VA pension benefits underwent changes. For example, only after World War I was the modern concept of pensions for non-service-connected disabilities enacted. In 1930, VA pension benefits resulting from non-service-connected disability was extended to widows and dependent children. In 1958, the eligibility rules were tightened by imposing more stringent income guidelines as well as limitations on net worth. In addition, pensioners were required to submit annual income verification reports. If a pensioner was overpaid, VA benefit regulations provided for a process to adjust future pension benefits. Starting in 1972, the VA was authorized to deduct unusual medical expenses from income. However, application of these deductions was discretionary with the case adjudicator on a case-by-case -case basis. As a consequence, adjudicators excluded expenses that they did not consider to be unusual. Accordingly, in 1978, the Pension Improvement Act explicitly provided that unreimbursed medical expenses would be excluded from a claimant's income. This act redefined unusual as excessive. It also categorized health insurance premiums as unusual expenses. This legislation provided that any unreimbursed medical expenses exceeding 5% of the claimant's income would be considered unusual and could be deducted. The Veterans and Survivors Improved Pension Act expanded the eligibility for active duty wartime veterans, their surviving spouses and dependent children to receive pension benefits for non-service connected disabilities. This legislation provided additional benefits for housebound veterans as well as the ability of housebound veterans and veterans in need of aid and attendance to subtract unreimbursed medical expenses from their incomes in order to qualify for VA benefits. Generally, the Pension Improvement Act of 1978 provides the basis for the current pension guidelines. In conclusion, the veterans benefit can play a crucial role in planning for long-term care. It can provide a lifeline that holds out hope to a veteran and his family. To review, in order to receive the enhanced monthly pension, an applicant must first establish the requisite military service and limited income and assets. In addition, the claimant must demonstrate the need for regular aid and attendance of another person. The need for assistance of another person must be regular but need not be constant. Be warned, however, that the application process can be cumbersome and daunting. The VA system has its inherent problems, which can be frustrating. As aid and attendance is a means-tested program, any income, unless specifically excluded, is counted, and net worth is counted to the extent that it can reasonably be expected to provide for the claimant's care. 
Also expect that sometime in the future, Congress may tighten these means-tested qualification rules by making them more consistent with the Medicaid requirements. Don't forget that a veteran's asset protection estate plan to be effective must consider and address both the Medicaid and VA requirements. Folks, that's our program. As always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching. I'm attorney Ramsey Barawi, Building a Trust.